the opposite, in fact. I want to thank you for asking me, not just because, you know, it's nice to do these things, but because I love the format. And it's given me the opportunity to listen to, I've listened, honestly, I've listened to five or six since agreeing to oh. do it because I love them. Oh, and thank it's really you. great to hear access doing it. And I realise, because you mention it every now and again, that Simon's your brother. Now, mm. and that makes me realise that I must have met you because didn't you come to I, see Yeah, I we will have met very briefly because I, I think he, he considers me somewhat his good luck charm and often invites me to watch the last run in the rehearsal room. And I remembered that. One of my favourite ways of watching theatre is that sort of rehearsal room run. And I think some of the things I've enjoyed most in my life are when my brother has invited me along to those last runs. Because yeah. there's something very magical when essentially the actors and the show are basically ready. You know, they're, they're prepared, mm -hmm. they're doing great performances. You all know what you're doing. Um, but you're, you're not in costume yet and there isn't a set. And there's something about the sort of imagination of that. that... I just realised it's, uh, you know, it's a very rare privilege in a sense because we're either in the show and mm. therefore you know and we know it from that sense or you know if we're nothing to do with it we just go and watch the finished product when it's in it so you never get to see anyone else's kind of yeah. almost ready production. and i have yeah. to say i've never maybe with less prepared people this would happen but i've never seen a car crash as well you know it's not like even though <laughs> oh, it's the I've actors some, don't worry. right <laughs> <laughs> invite me along to those steps that'd be interesting yeah. to see um but no i think no matter how much the actors can sometimes feel like oh god this yeah. isn't ready we don't know what we're doing you know i've often found that i go along yeah. and watch these certainly the ones my brothers i'll watch them and i'll be like that's brilliant you know i'm always yeah. at the end like that was awesome it was so yeah good. no there generally is that and it, there's there's often that feeling that the actors think oh my god we're not ready mm. however once or twice <laughs> it's been justified you're right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um so stefan stefan can i call you steph yes please do only teachers who are annoyed at me used to call me Stefan. Okay, I'm glad I checked that then. <laughs> Tell us what the speech is, uh, what play it's from, and a brief intro to why you love it so much. Yeah, well, first of all, I have to, you know, a disclaimer. When you asked me to do this and I quickly, hurriedly said, oh, just, you know, a speech that you know, I sort of love because I love the imagery and the context of it. Um, uh, and and I, I told you what the speech was before I name it, and then realised and looked at it and thought, oh, actually, it's not a speech. It's not a character <laughs> it's a who scene. talks quite a lot. <laughs> it's actually a scene. And I've always in my mind just remembered it as a speech because I obviously only remember my own bits, but, <laughs> as most actors, you know, cut out the other bit. Um, but it, it sort of can work as a speech. And then I looked at it, and it's, it's actually um, a, a speech of Edgar's uh, in a scene with Gloucester from King Lear in Act 4, Scene 6. And, um, and I sort of thought, oh, well, maybe Lucy doesn't want me to do that. So, uh, so then I thought, well, I, I want to do something from Lear, so I'll have a look. And maybe I'll do a speech from Lear, you know, just because not that I've ever played Lear. And I thought, oh, that great speech of, you know, Let's Away to Prison. And then I listened to your pod wonderful podcast. I really enjoyed it. And then I listened to an episode of Richard Eyre talking about that speech. I thought, well, I'm not going to do that speech if Richard Eyre has just done it and talk so eloquently and articulately about it. So I went back to it. And and lo and behold, on my, you'll see my old copy. Here. Oh, lovely. I, ha I, have, I have actually marked it up as a speech with the cut. I've cut out the Gloucester bit. Perfect. And I put start and end. And so at some point, it made me realise, I don't know when or what for, yeah. I've actually done it as a speech, for maybe for an audition or something. Great. Like I don't know what. But anyway, you can do it as a speech. We can thank right? past Steph for this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have no idea when I did that, but I've done some great parts in great plays, but I'm, ne I'm not really an actor that's done parts that have big speeches, you know. Mm. Um, I haven't played Hamlet. I haven't played Macbeth. Um, and I haven't done, you know... And that's kind of that's the kind of actor I am in a sense. I'm not I'm not necessarily that actor who's done those kind of contemplative speeches, and so I don't have a speech in that sense. But yeah. and also, what I feel I love about theatre is very much contained in this speech, in this scene, if you like. Mm. But in this speech, which is um, for a start, as a as an opportunity for an actor, the versatility that you have to have to to play this part, to play Edgar is kind of typified in this little section where he has to be three people, in effect. He has to be poor Tom, um, although poor Tom himself is 
um, questioned by Gloucester to be no longer like poor Tom. So there's something going on with Edgar that maybe his persona, character, accent, whatever of poor Tom is already dropping and he's kind of becoming... Because um, Gloucester said, methinks thy voice is altered and thou speaks in better phrase and matter than thou did. So there's obviously something going on for Tom, but, but he's denying it. We don't really know why. I'm not, I'm not quite clear why he doesn't much earlier say to Gloucester, look, I'm your son. You know, he's blind now and he's 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 forgiven Edgar. But anyway, we go through this dramatic kind of construct where he, he still plays along with being poor Tom. Then he, in a Can side, I, wait, I'm so yeah, sorry to on. interrupt you, Steph. Can I use what you just said there to give the briefest sentence of intro to someone who might not sure, know King Lear? Yeah, so sorry. Yeah, Edgar is Gloucester's son. Gloucester is sort of a friend slash... Um, peer of King Lear's. Yeah, absolutely. Bad way of describing and it, dramatically a kind of parallel mirror kind mm. of character. Yeah. And uh Edgar, I mean I'm I'm sort of doing that. I'm actually not Lear is one of the ones that I I know Sorry. less well. Yeah. But so an Edgar um is his legitimate son. Is his legitimate son and versus Edmund heir. Edmund is a bastard son. Edmund is a bastard son. And why does he need to forgive Gloucester? What had Gloucester done wrong? Gloucester has exiled him. So Edmund, the bastard, is um, often coveted as a, a kind of great, you know, Shakespearean part. But actually, I really think Edgar's a better part because Edmund is far more one dimensional. He's a real baddie in the way that Iago is or whatever and has some great speeches. It yeah. would have been easy speeches from Edmund to pick. <laughs> but actually, he doesn't go very far as a character, mm. you know. So he, um, in envy, jealousy, because he's illegitimate will not inherit, will not, you know, have any of Gloucester's lands or anything. And mm -hmm. so sets up his brother, his legitimate brother, with his father. He he intimates to his father that Edgar is plotting to get rid of him, to inherit mm -hmm. his land sooner and so on. Um, does this successfully, a little implausibly at times, but he does this successfully. So he turns his father against Edgar. Um, Edgar has to flee. He then flees out to the heath, out to the countryside, disguises himself as a poor beggar. And mm. that's where he meets uh, Lear and the Fool and Kent out on the heath in the storm and so on. Then when, without going through all of the plot, but mm -hmm. Gloucester basically then has been blinded by uh, one of Lear's daughters and son-in-law. And then they, uh, Edgar discovers Gloucester blind, wandering the countryside. Gloucester asks him, uh, for his help to take him to Dover Cliffs so that he can kill himself. Mm -hmm. And that's where this scene happens, where Edgar, who is his Gloucester son, as poor Tom has said, here you are, you're at the cliff, you can kill yourself now. But mm -hmm. we'll see in the speech that that's not what happens. Yeah, amazing. Does that, does that make any sense? That was an <laughs> excellent summary. So tell us more about why you love this moment. You said something about this sort of moment typifying the like versatility of the So character. I think that, I mean, I was it was a gift. I mean, I'll tell you a little bit of the context, shall I, of yes, me please. doing this? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. I mean, I, I partly chose this, I have to say as well, because this is the production. I've got the most, or the best anyway, anecdotes of <laughs> all yes. plays that I've Perfect. done. Perfect. <laughs> because I did it at Theatre Cloyd in 2001. I'd done lots by then, at theater, or quite a bit anyway, at Theatre Cloyd by then it's a fantastic place and I went there first in 97 and Terry Hans had just taken over mm -hmm. and he formed the company there and you know in, in a very similar way to what he did at the RSC on a, on a smaller scale and we did amazing things and I learned more from him than I have from any other director I think I mean it was mm -hmm. wonderful to be there during that time it was a real golden age so this was what four years into that time there um, he did Lear and he asked me to play Edgar mm -hmm. now uh, do you know of Nicole Williamson? Do you know who no. he is? Right, okay. I should have told you this maybe before to, to, to <laughs> Google him because he is a remarkable actor and mm. an incredible character, but deeply, deeply flawed. He was one of the greatest Shakespearean actors of his generations. He played Hamlet in 1967, I think, which has right. been filmed. And if you ever get a chance to see it, you, honestly, you should. It was done at the Roundhouse. Um, uh, Tony Richardson directed it, I think. Okay. And um, Marianne Faithful played Ophelia. And Tony Hopkins played Claudius. And they're, about, they're exactly the same age. If not, Tony Hopkins might be a few months younger than him. And it was a wonderful, incredible production. He played Macbeth with Helen Mirren at the RSC and Malvolio. You know. um, and then he went to America and he played Merlin in Excalibur. And he became kind of quite well known for that. And then he did quite a lot of films and I think. So he hadn't done any theatre for many years. He'd been doing odd little, you know, films and da-da-da, living in right. America, living in Amsterdam. 
and Terry asked him back. And he also had a bit of a reputation for um, tantrums and walking off stage and things like this. So Fun. anyway, Terry asked him to come and do Leah. <laughs> but it was a, a fascinating experience. You know, he'd only rehearse 10 till 1 because then he'd go to the pub and learn his lines. And right. I have compassion for that, obviously. He was ill, you know, he's an alcoholic. Mm. And mm. anyway, he died about 10 years ago now. Uh, so this is the last thing he did for many. He didn't do another play after this and he hadn't done one Gosh. for many. It was a one-off, you know. Mm. But it was fascinating being with him because there were glimpses, especially in the Heath scenes with the absurdity of those, like, you know, Beckett, because he'd done Beckett as well. He'd done original. Mm. He was in, I think he's in the, the the filmed version of Waiting for Godot, for example. Oh, wow. Right? Okay. I mean, honestly, look him up. He's incredible. Yeah, yeah, I will. But, you know, the real kind of genius flawed alcoholic was going like that you know mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. on the third preview he walked off uh he came on for the first scene he he drank too much that day yeah you know in the afternoon yeah. came on was not really with it and he launched into the first speech of you know dividing the kingdom and within about six lines was kind of forgetting it and kind of grasping and in the end sort of started to improvise a little bit in iambic pentameter at first of how he, you know and then he then sort of launched into that he was not able to carry on and he thought oh god he's just going to walk off but then he launched into no this is the end of my career that i have you know <laughs> that he was you know that he was once capable of great things but now no longer this was one step too far for him and he was going to have to give up and all of this and everybody's just staring at you because you're all on stage, you know, apart from... The I was about to say who was on stage at the time. Everyone, you know, Terry had it to this big open stage and everyone's there just watching the dividing the kingdom and the marriage of, you know, or the, yeah. the um, engagement of Cordelia. And you all doing that thing of sort of, to a certain extent, being like, who's going to go and does someone need to say something? Does someone need to yeah. but he go was, to him? He was, you, but what you realise, if you look at his CV and his Wikipedia pages, mm. he's done this many times. Oh. He's, done on, <laughs> he's done it on Broadway. He'd done it on, you know, he'd done it, it, it several times. And so oh, he's right. back on the next night, is the, the long story short. Right. He um, he did walk off that night. Uh, he also said at one point, I'm not a wealthy man, but I'd personally refund you all for this evening. <laughs> Which the theatre kept to him, kept him to. Anyway, he walked off oh that God. night. And, and of course, the trouble with that is, even though he came on the next night and got through it fine, for the rest of the run... Everybody's kind of on... like, when's he going to do it again? When's yeah. he going to do it again? You know, yeah. so that was that makes it, it just a fact memorable. That he, that, yeah, <laughs> and, and but also memorable for good reasons as well. In that it was mm. a wonderful company of friends of, you know, mine who you know, Sharon Morris playing Cordelia and Julian Lewis Jones playing Kent, and uh, you know, just wonderful company of people. Great uh, with Nickel of of Terry Hans's company really mm, with Nickel mm. Williamson and. Um, there were flashes of genius. There really were. Mm. And I learned so much because for me, this, I was whatever I was in my early thirties. And this is the first part I'd been offered where you could really fly, you know, you, there yeah. was nothing to limit you as, uh, you know, you had the, the sort of classic Shakespearean kind of character of, of Edgar, you know, or just a, a nobleman, if you like. Yeah. But then you became this wild thing, which, I did with my Welsh accent and, you know. Yeah, lovely. I loved it. And I learned so much because Terry was, you know, he, he could be a real stickler and he could get on your case. But I think he he respected and he rewarded um, ambition and just going for something, you know. If you really offered things up and you let down your inhibitions and, you know, he would encourage that. And that was, yeah. I, I love that as an actor, you know. I don't like being bound in to oh I feel a, like that's surely the best way so what was um because you said that Terry was so sort of influential on you yeah. what influential to you what was his method like what was a rehearsal room like with him well I think for one thing um the what one reason I learned so much about Shakespeare with him is that uh one thing he developed at the RSC that he brought to Cloyd when he did Shakespeare was to do sonnet sessions so um we would a few times a week, about three times a week, the first hour after lunch would be a sonnet session, nothing to do with the play. So you would all be told at the beginning um, of this of the rehearsal process to learn a sonnet. Nice. By heart. Yeah. And to be ready to give it at any moment. You know, so basically then for an hour, we'd sit around and he'd say, OK, uh, Julian, do you want to give it? So, you know, and Julian would have to do his. And then as 
kindly and supportively as possible we'd all with terry's guidance deconstructed tell him what you know what was clear what couldn't what we couldn't quite understand how you might use the rhythm to give the meaning more emphasis or whatever you know what i mean you would and um i learned so much from that. i learned a huge amount from doing that because each sonnet is really just like any speech from a shakespeare play um and so you learned about giving it a title to be or not to be yeah. that is the question so this is the title of my sonnet you know and then and then you give the arguments and you know and then and then you sum up at the end with a couplet and you know you know you really do learn by doing and by watching yeah, and I totally. think it was one of the things I struggled with when I went to drama school was that like I'd been at university where mm -hmm. I had been allowed to just do plays all the time mm. and there's obviously a huge amount to be gained from drama school in terms of technique and stuff like that. But I would say my real training, my real learning was when I should have been doing my degree, but I wasn't. And I was just doing like a different play every week, you know, because you're learning, yeah. you're testing things out. And then I found it really hard going into drama school and obviously sort of being treated slightly as we can't trust you with words yet. Yeah, I think, I mean, because I didn't go to drama school, but I did a lot of, I did a drama course at university, a very mm. practical, good drama course at Exeter University, but I didn't go to drama school then after. So I hope that that experience has made me more eager to learn from directors like Terry. So I've never, I've never got professionally kind of thought, well, okay, I know how I'm going to do. I just look, you know, and I look for tips from good directors and I go, how should I do this? You know? Yeah. And any technique I have or have learned has been through that hunger to learn from them because I never went to drama school and, yeah. and had my own kind of technique if you like you know so do you like if you go into a new part mm. say like any of the I'm thinking stage here more than mm. screen but I guess it's probably the same for screen to what extent do you go in being like I'm a blank canvas and I'm going to wait and see what you say and to what extent do you a little like you said Terry really applauded do you like make a choice yourself about the way you're going to play it and give that on day one and see what you get back? Hmm, that's a good question. Uh, I think a sort of, ni neither of the, what you <laughs> Somewhere said. In the <laughs> <middle>. <laughs> Somewhere in the middle. But uh, more to do with, I think, if anything, I will, I'm quite bold, I think, and, mm -hmm. and but but I'm not necessarily bold with in a defensive way you know bold in like i've made this decision to do this and i'm gonna do it this way you know i'm mm -mm -mm. i can i'm bold i like what i like to be is to be bold in the moment so i'll like oh i'll give it i'll give it, i'll just try it this way and then yeah. it's an offering or not that's not yeah and they go I, i'm kind of fine if they don't like it you know what i mean like, yeah okay great. i'll try another way then you know yeah yeah i will go through a script a lot obviously and and mm -hmm. and get the muscle memory around the script uh with especially vocally um and i will try and delve into who the character is mm. but not with any I don't have any set technique to do that and I don't have any set technique to look at the script either because I think writers write in such different ways I don't think you can analyze a pinter in the way that you can a, a Shakespeare in the same way you know you can analyze yeah. them both, but you can't do the same I don't think in both personally do you um do you think you do things differently with screen because I I ask that because I feel that I have become quite perhaps this is a pessimistic thing, quite deflated by um, the struggle to get work, that f when it comes to the screen realm, I become quite... The, the way I deal with it is, of course, to be like, they'll like me or they won't like me. Mm. I'm right or I'm not right. It's which not is, that I can... Which is make, right Which is, of yeah. course, correct. But I think I become... I don't think it's laziness, but I become more passive when I am, for instance, auditioning for screen roles, where I am much more happy to be like, this is Lucy doing the lines. Yeah. And is what you want, Lucy, or do you want something else? Whereas I think in theatre, I would go into an audition feeling much more, you know, well, how can I embody this part and persuade yeah, you? Yeah, I, I, right I think that, I mean, the difficult thing, obviously, and I include myself in this, but certainly for younger actors or less experienced actors, is to realise that, that boldness that I was talking about is mm. what is what casting directors and and TV and screen directors are looking for as well. Yeah. It's, it, but it but it's hard to kind of be bold. It's you know because you mm. think oh that's I'm just doing too much now or you know, um, and I'm not talking about just being big. I'm talking about yeah. being bold. You know. Yeah. I mean the absolute minimalism minimalism of a part might be the boldness that they're looking for or you know it's hard. But I think just yeah it's. Ugh. 
who knows if they look i mean if there was a perfect answer we'd all get all the work so yeah. <laughs> the perfect answer is that <laughs> there needs to be fewer of us yeah but we all just want to do it because it's fun <laughs> so so Absolutely. okay so you said the speech that the well the scene that you've picked mm. you love the versatility of it you also said something about the poetry earlier on what yeah, about well, it is so beautiful talk to me about that the the thing is i always remember what another thing terry said he's Mm. Uh, he could be a little bit of a headmaster sometimes but he, you know so he say so what is the difference you, you know pick pick on somebody say lucy what is the difference between prose and poetry and you, i mean well, okay i'll ask you what do you think lucy? oh god that's like what is no, poetry tough. like what is exactly. art i'd it be is, okay in tough. shakespeare i'd be like um well the verse will be an iambic pentameter perhaps and the prose won't well Okay, so is this oh, is this the poetry then? This is this is iambic pentameter. Okay, mm -hmm. I heard myself proclaimed, and by the happy hollow of a tree escaped the hunt. No port is free, no place that guard and most unusual vigilance does not attend my taking. I mean, it's just information, isn't it? Yes, that's a very good point. Yes, it's not poetic. <laughs> exactly, it's just information yeah. in a ver in verse. You yes, know? yeah. So we all scrabbled around with that, and some bright spark, uh, who was you know people of the day, said. The imagery. And he went, yes, mm. exactly. So it's imagery <laughs> is what poetry. <laughs> Gold star. In, in, in Terry Hans' world. And I agree, really. You know, imagery yeah. is what. And that can be in in prose form. And this is this is a mixture of prose and poetry, really, I would mm. say. I would say that Edgar almost can't help himself becoming poetic. Whilst he's trying to, in a prosaic way, describe to Gloucester where he is, he um he uses incredible poetry i think then to to give a sense of so when you know the, the opening speech of uh, the uh, prologue to henry the fifth when he says when we speak of horses mm, imagine i love that, that. See them, or whatever you know yeah. basically that's what shakespeare does in this speech he just gives this actor the opportunity to describe oh, yeah. a world to say look this is where you are but he's lying. When it's not there. Well. Yes. It's, it's not that's so there. good. It's oh, like I love this that. sort of almost a postmodernist kind of like, you know, we all know we're in the theatre and you could be pretending to be on a cliff describing this. But the irony is you're not even there. You're like, well, you could, you, you I mean, there's different interpretations in the uh, the Richard Eyre one, the, the um, Tony Hopkins one. They set it kind of back from the cliff. As if right. he's, you know, so he, he is there, but not he is on the there, edge. but he's not yet at the cliff edge. Or other productions could imagine that he's already on the beach, you know. So he's taken into the beach, and then when he lands, he's on the yeah. beach rather than. I mean, who knows? Yeah, yeah. But basically, you're not at the cliff's edge where you're saying you are, but you're describing it, and you're saying, look, look at, and the perspective, the la the language that he uses to dis to describe perspective, like an artist almost, like look. You know the um, that that boat is like its cock, or you know, like a little rowing boat, and its cock is like a, a boy. You know, and 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 as if you can see things getting smaller yeah. and smaller the distance away. And then when the passerby describes, oh, I saw you fall, and he says, you know, you you fell ten fathoms from, you know, and and he has all these descriptions of falling. He said, if if you were like a feather or gossamer, you know, you would have. But, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable the way that he describes things that haven't happened. You know? Yes. You said he can't, um, he almost can't help being poetic or, yeah. or slipping into poetry. Is he quite a poetic character? Yeah, I think so. But he's also, I mean, it's such a fascinating play, isn't it? Because there's no simple things about this play. He is changed on the heath like they all are. You know, they... There's this middle section, which is like this Beckett play. You know, it's sort of not like Shakespeare at all. It's sort of 400 years earlier, like Waiting for Godot, where you've got Lear, um, Kent, the Fool, and then they're joined by Edgar, who is playing poor Tom, and eventually by Gloucester, who comes to, you know, try to rescue them. And and they and they have a mock trial and they have of his daughters and so on and they have and it's absolute absurdist situations in the pouring rain or in this little hovel that they're sheltering from this pouring rain like this almost like this little separate play you know so he and he's seen leah's madness he's seen his father's blindness so he's been changed he's been affected and um and i think you know he feels that he's been betrayed by his father in the first place and then um you know, he has to find a place of forgiveness in order to save his life, you know. Yes. I mean, i, I got to be honest, uncon maybe consciously, there are other reasons I chose this, which is to do with that relationship with father and son. You know, I was, as I say, in my early 30s then, and my father came to see this, and it was probably only two or three years before he died. And so I was really pleased that he saw me do this part, you know. And I, and I do remember thinking the night that 
um, Nicola Williamson walked off and we thought, well, that's it. We've only done two previews and we're yeah, never going to do it again. But, yeah, it's not anymore. Yeah, I remember feeling really disappointed that my dad hadn't seen it, you know. Um, but he did get to see it eventually. And, of course, now I'm more like my dad's age then, you know. I'm, yeah. And I have a son who's in his, he's a bit younger than I was doing this. Yeah. But the, those, all of those things about fatherhood, fathers and sons and sons and fathers and the the which were massive for Shakespeare. I mean, we haven't got time to go into all of that. It was huge. You know, Mm. so many of his themes are about succession and being a father. And, you know, I mean, it's huge. And there are better academics than me to talk (laughs) about that. But, you know. Do you, you know, you just said, obviously now you have a son, you know, you're Mm. a father yourself. And do you look at moments like this? And read them differently now, oh, as in absolutely. just in your head, yeah. Oh, absolutely. No, then. I mean, I don't naturally feel like Edgar now in any way. I mm. feel like Gloucester. Yeah. And I want to play Gloucester. Anyone out there? I want. <laughs> Great. Put it into the world. <laughs> Stefan Rodri for then, Gloucester. Then, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, of course. I feel more like Gloucester now, and that's natural, you know. And that's wonderful. I think that's great in Shakespeare when you, you know, I feel more like Henry the Fourth than Henry the Fifth now, you know. Mm, so mm. I'd love to do. I always wanted to play Hal, and I never did, but I wouldn't mind doing Henry the Fourth Part One now and play Henry the Fourth, you know. I do think that when people talk about, you know, I think we're quite lucky because in lots of sort of. Um, uh, creative and public roles it feels like there is a sell-by date and I think as actors what's lovely is you just move into new uh, categories of Absolutely. fabulous parts and in fact a lot of the time the parts get better I I'd say where so. you're at the parts are more interesting I, I kind of feel that yeah I mean and of course there are some that span the ages you know I'm playing Banco now and I'm yeah 56 and Ray yeah. Fiennes is 59 you know but we but we could have been doing that when we were 36 and 39 absolutely or, you know so yeah. also I think if you're like me you know as an actor I think I can play anything really sometimes in my you know in my bedroom when I'm going over I, think I can play that but but from the outside you know directors and casting directors will see actually they're better for that than that or you know what I mean just in terms of type or age or whatever it is that's and what you have to keep telling my mother you know it's like the classic <laughs> thing of like the parent who's like you should have been that you could have played that and you're like yeah I could I could have done I, I could mean, have a, done a they're classic better. example of that was with Terry Hans who he, he once asked me oh you must tell me if you want to play anything here you know he'd sort of flatter you like that and I had I didn't have the guts at all to say it but I, did, I said I'd love to play John Proctor one day. This is when I was younger as well. And he said, yes, yes, you must. And then about th- two or three years later, he decided to do The Crucible. And he wrote to me to say, um, I'm doing The Crucible, but um, I'd like you to play Hale. <laughs> 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 you sod, why you did you asked, me, You asked. I told asked. you. It's the one thing I feel yes. like my vulnerability was just out there going, okay, well, maybe that then. And he <laughs> But what he did is he, cut, as, as I say, Julian Lewis-Jones played Kent in Leah and he, he asked mm. Julian to play John Proctor. And Julian mm. is much more John Proctor than I am, in a sense. You could and be I, John Proctor now. I, well, I, I mean, I think I could have done it then. But, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I, what I'm saying is I loved playing Hale because mm. Hale was Hale's journey is just massive, you know, um, yeah. and in a sense was more interesting than doing John Proctor. I know John yeah. Proctor has that central kind of, you know, but actually a bit like with Edgar... I think Terry thought, oh, he's he's an actor who likes to go on those big journeys like Hale has to, you know? So and he, he was, knew you he better than right you, in a you way. yourself. He knew me better than I, yeah, exactly. Just the vanity for me is that John Proctor's sort of the lead or whatever, even though it's a m- massive ensemble, but, you know, it's more memorable. But actually, Terry knew that Hale was better suited to what I like yeah. to do, you know? We should read the speech. <laughs> it's been an absolute pleasure. It's been such a lovely time chatting. My pleasure. Come on, sir, here's the place. Stand still. How fearful and dizzy it is to cast one's eyes so low. The crows and chuffs that wing the midway air show scarce so gross as beetles. Halfway down hangs one that gathers some fire. Dreadful trade. Methinks he seems no bigger than his head. The fishermen that walk upon the beach appear like mice. And yon tall anchoring bark diminished to her cock, her cock a boy, almost too small for sight. The murmuring surge that on the numbered idle pebble chafes cannot be heard so high. I look no more, lest my brain turn and the deficient sight topple down headlong. Give me your hand. You are now within a foot of the extreme verge. By all beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Now, 
Fay well, good sir. Why I do trifle thus with his despair is done to cure it. Gone, sir, farewell. And yet I know not how conceit may rob the treasury of life when life itself yields to the theft. Had he been where he thought by this, had thought been past. Alive or dead? Oh, you, sir, friend! Hear you, sir, speak! Thus might he pass indeed, yet he revives. What are you, sir? Hadst thou been aught but gossamer, feathers, air, so many fathom down precipitating, thou shivered like an egg. But thou dost breathe. Hast heavy substance, bleeds not, speaks, art sound. Ten masts at each make not the altitude which thou hast perpendicularly fell from the dread summit of this chalky bourne. Look up a height. The shrill gorged lark so far cannot be seen or heard. Do but look up. This is above all strangeness. Upon the crown of the cliff, what thing was that which parted from you? As I stood here below, methought his eyes were two full moons. He had a thousand noses, horns welked and waved like the enraged sea. It was some fiend. Therefore, thou happy father, think that the clearest gods who make them honours of men's impossibilities have preserved thee. That was so fabulous. Thank you so much. Thank you. I feel like a little child. That was... <laughs> I loved the comparison you made when we were chatting and you'd said about... Uh, like the Henry V speech, you know, when you when we speak yeah. of horses, think you see them. And having thought about that then, the moment when I, I'm trying to find the line now, you said something about like a step, you are, you're a step. You are now within a foot right. of the, the extreme, extreme verge. verge. Yeah, by That's all it. beneath the moon would I not leap upright. Yeah, yeah, when you said that, I almost like felt it in my bum. You know, like I was really like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like that, I'm near the edge of something high. Um, so, oh, thank you so much, Steph. Thank that you. was thank awesome. You. I loved that. Yeah.